today. Supposedly we're in Galatians chapter 5 verse 19, but we're going to be all over the place. Uh, rather than go over those verses, I thought we'd go over the first fruit of the Spirit, love, and talk about what it means to be a fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> it is very difficult to get up here and speak and not give your personal opinions at times and have them confused for the truth of the Word of God. And I apologize for that. That's why we have an eat and ask after the uh, time that I speak so that you can hold my feet to the fire for things that are inaccurate or could be looked at from a different perspective. So I invite each one of you to come to the NASC. We have some grilled hamburgers, some grilled chicken breasts, and some grilled hot dogs with some watermelon and other things people brought. Please feel free to stay and enjoy the food and enjoy uh, asking uh, questions. Um, I had a plan as to what I would speak on today, somewhere around Monday or Tuesday, and last night it sort of changed. So I'm going in a different direction. I may not have the slightest idea what I'm doing, uh, but um, hopefully there is a word from the Lord that will be profitable for you and for me. Let me go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace and your amazing love that you would send your son into the world to save such wretches as us. And we thank you that your son willingly became the propitiation for our sins, that he offered himself as the sacrifice worthy to pay for the sin of the world and that you have granted us the faith and have awakened us from the dead so that we might have the glorious privilege of trusting in you of knowing the true and the living god having the hope of the resurrection and the down payment of the holy spirit thank you for all these magnificent gifts which you have given to us and we pray that those gifts would be used in the lives of your people to bring honor and glory to your name. We ask your spirit to be our teacher today, that we would grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and so honor him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Citizenship. What is citizenship? Well, some people think of it as a grade in school as to how well you play with others. Some think of it as a place where you reside, your location in the time-space continuum. Others think of it as an attitude. When you say something like, I'm an American, you mean you live in the United States of America, but you usually mean far more than that. What does it mean to be a citizen of a country, and what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? For Paul told us, our citizenship is not of this earth, but we have a heavenly citizenship. Let me give you an illustration of an individual I recently saw a documentary on, and I apologize that I'm a sports enthusiasts and use sports analogies, I'm sorry, but hopefully you guys know enough about sports to understand this story. There was a defensive end for the Philadelphia Eagles, his name was Reggie White, and he played many years for the Eagles hoping he would win a Super Bowl trophy with the Philadelphia Eagles. It turned out that it wasn't going to happen. So in free agency, Reggie White got to choose the team he wanted to go to. And he chose the Green Bay Packers. And in his first year with the Green Bay Packers, they went to the Super Bowl and they won it. And they have Reggie White holding up the Vince Lombardi trophy running around the field. But before that happened, they had an interview with Reggie White. And they asked him, can you be fulfilled without a championship trophy? And his answer was, 
Of course I can. I am fulfilled. I recognized many years ago that if I should win a championship trophy, my days on earth are numbered and I need to be ready for heaven. So he's running around the stadium with this trophy. And what do the sports announcers say? This is heaven on earth. It doesn't get any better than this. And although Reggie White was greatly excited about winning the Super Bowl, he would have never said that. Because his citizenship was not in Philadelphia, was not in Green Bay, his citizenship was in heaven. And that's how he lived his life. So much so that he said, if all I'm ever remembered for is being a good football player, I've wasted my life. So is it possible to have a citizenship in heaven and have a taste of that on the earth. Well, that's what the announcers were saying. This is heaven on earth. It's as good as it gets here. But if that's as good as it gets, that's pretty sorry. As good as that is. So let's think about how we can experience a little heaven on earth as believers. Well, in Galatians chapter 5, and in verse 22, Paul says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now there's differing opinions, but it's basically the same thing. Some individuals think that love is put first because it's the foremost of the fruit of the Spirit. Some people think love is put first is because that is the fruit of the Spirit and it's demonstrated in all the rest of them. To every way you look at it, love is very, very important. So let's take a look at how important this fruit of the Spirit is. In Matthew chapter 3, there's an outline in your bulletin if you want to use one of those. It may be more confusing than it's worth. Sometimes my students said they had no idea where I was. I understood that. In Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, and he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. How important is this fruit? John the Baptist said, fruit must be born in keeping with repentance. And if it's not, you remain a brood of vipers ready for the judgment to come. There needs to be a repentance, a turning from the way you're headed, and a turning to God. Even as Jim was mentioning in Sunday school, there's two ways of looking at life. Either the day-to-day -day normal human activity apart from God, or seeing everything is done as unto the Lord. Well, here was a group of religious zealots who had a self-righteousness that the people thought was genuine righteousness. And John the Baptist says they are a brood of vipers and they need to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, how can you live a life so sanctified and so uh, according to the laws, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and need to bring fruit according to repentance? Because that was a human righteousness. What is the fruit according to repentance? the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. This, I can guarantee you, the Pharisees and the Sadducees did not practice. For they sought and were successful in putting to death the Son of God. That, my friends, is not love. Matthew chapter 7, 
verse 16 to 20. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. You will know who by their fruits. The false prophets, the false teachers. So the way to know a false prophet is by his fruit. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. What kind of fruit does a grapevine bear? Grapes, good fruit, something you can eat. What does a thorn bush bear? Nothing. Nothing worthy of anything. There's no fruit there at all. We're not talking about somebody showing love to a certain degree and somebody showing love to a different degree and it's not equal and that sort of... We're talking about somebody who's showing the fruit of the Spirit and somebody who's showing nothing. You will know them by their fruits. Just keep watching them and you'll tell if they are a loving individual. So how is this fruit produced? In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives a parable of the soils where a sower went out to sow and he sprinkled his seed in his bag upon uh, four different kinds of soils. And he says in Matthew chapter 13 and in verse 9, he who has ears, let him hear. A man must have ears to hear. If a man does not have ears to hear, he will not hear. Again, take God in the Bible out of all of your uh, governmental activities and out of all your governmental schools, and what do you expect the government to do? They don't have ears to hear, so will they do what they should do? No. The government doesn't want ears to hear. They've already said that. Get Christ, God, and the Bible out of everything that belongs to us, and we will... Put that under separation of church and state. So a man who doesn't have ears, he cannot hear. Let her be not all men have such ears. Jesus said in verse 14, you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. Be thankful. Rejoice. Give praise to God that you have eyes to see and ears to hear. For not everybody does. And eyes to see and ears to hear are a gift from God. What is the necessity? What has to happen? What makes the difference between a man with eyes that can see and a man with eyes that can't see? The necessity is the conversion of a new heart. It's the conversion of a new heart that bears fruit. And it bears fruit when the word is sown in that heart. What was the difference in the fourth soil? It bore fruit. The other three soils never bore fruit. What would make it such that your heart could bear fruit? You would need a new one. Because the heart you're born with is incapable of bearing fruit. You need a heart transplant. 
You need a heart that has the capability of bearing fruit because it's a new heart given to you by God. And all of those hearts, all such hearts that have been given by God, do bear fruit. Jesus said some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. It may not always be the same amount of fruit, but it will be fruit. And sometimes when we're bearing 30 fold and we want to bear 100 fold, we think we aren't bearing any at all. We're bearing fruit. God establishes the relationship with him by giving us a new heart, and he will ensure that heart bears fruit. And even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. In John chapter 15 and verse 2, How else is this fruit, what else takes place when this fruit is born besides the need of a new heart? Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. In order to bear fruit, a man must abide in Christ. There is no fruit bearing apart from abiding in Christ. As Jim was talking about in the morning, if you follow the ways of your heart and the ways of man... The fruit you bear is worthless, and it's toilsome. But if you do the same thing as unto the Lord, that's fruitful bearing. It made me think of the verse, and I've thought of this earlier this week, the plowing of the wicked is sin. Well, he's just going outside and plowing his field and trying to earn a crop so he can stay alive with some food. It's sin. Because anything done apart from God is sin. The wicked, why does he plow? For himself. Upon what does he trust? He trusts in his ability as a farmer. Everything is about him. So even his ordinary daily activity is sin. We must abide in Christ to bear fruit. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. And apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that John chapter 6 verse 63 says, It is the spirit that gives life and the flesh profits nothing? then we need to live that way. And if we live that way, there'll be a little taste of heaven on earth. And I'll show you why in a minute. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 6, Paul is saying that God has made us adequate to preach the gospel. He says in verse 6, Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The individual that thinks that there's a letter, a list, a set of commandments that I must abide by in order to bear fruit, is serving a ministry of death. But the one who serves in newness of the Spirit, where Christ is their Savior and their hope, it says the Spirit gives life. 
If we want to bear fruit for God, there is only one way to do so. And that's by being in the Spirit, in Christ, through faith in Him. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapters 9 and 10 says, I don't have any reason to talk to you all about love, for you are taught by God to love one another. They were taught by God to love. Is that possible? What did Jesus say? It's the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. What did Paul say? It's the Spirit that gives life. What did Jesus say? Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. So is it possible for the Thessalonians to have borne fruit just by being taught of God? Absolutely. That's what you would expect, as a matter of fact. So fruit must be born. What about this first and primary fruit, love? Why is it at the beginning? Why is it the supreme fruit of the Spirit? Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4. It was read for us today. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Why is love so important? Why is love put first? I don't want to get too overly simplistic. I know writing in a... Um, theological dictionary of things. There'd be a lot of other things to be said here. But love defines God. In both those verses, it says God is love. I'm going to have to say that if love defines God, it's pretty important. God is holy, holy, holy. God is faithful. There's many other things that God has given as attributes. But love isn't an adjective. Holy is an adjective. Faithful is an adjective. Love is a noun or an action. This is quite different. This tells us the manner in which God moves to accomplish his will. And how does he move? How does he act? What is his modus operandi? Love. Well, if that's true of God... It ought to be true of us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and this is what was so impossible to prepare this message. When you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you got like 18, 24, 32 messages alone. But we're going to go over it quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is greater than anything I can say. If I have oratory skills and have the persuasive speech and can say things in an amazing way, love is better than that. However I speak, if I speak with the tongues of men or of angels... Love is better than that. Then it says, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Faith is greater than knowledge. Excuse me, love is greater than knowledge. Jim's been going through the book of Revelation and will be going through it again tonight. And when we came to the book of Revelation and the letter to the church at Ephesus, it didn't sound like it could have happened. The church of Ephesus was orthodox. 
doctrinally sound, could spot a false prophet a mile away, and they were always right. And they were involved in all kinds of works. But they had left their first love. Is that possible? It's not only possible, it happened. But love is greater than knowledge. It is more important to practice love than to have a great deal of knowledge. Also in that verse, love is greater than faith. Oh, you may believe that the Lord is coming and your hope is in Him and you can't wait for the Lord to return and establish His kingdom and you're forward seeking and looking to the future and can't wait for things to happen. If you don't have love, it doesn't matter. How much you trust the Lord for the future is irrelevant. Love is more than faith. Verse 3, and if I give my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is greater than any sacrifice I could ever give. You could give of yourself entirely for the well-being of others. And if you don't have love, it doesn't profit you a bit. And at the end, in a most amazing statement to me, but now faith, hope, love, these three abide, but the greatest of these is love. I read in Hebrews, without faith it is impossible to please God. I think that'd be number one. No, the greatest of these is love. Because it most accurately reflects the nature of our God. And it is the way there is a little heaven on earth. So it's demonstration. How has love been demonstrated? And we've gone over these verses before, but I don't always listen to it, so I'm thinking maybe some of y'all don't always listen to it either, so I'm going to speak it again. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, a lawyer comes to Jesus and says, What should I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, What's written in the law? You look like a legal man and want to keep the law. What do you see it as? He says, love God and love your neighbor. Jesus says, hey, good answer. Do that and you will live. Anybody who can love God and love their neighbor, that's pretty much sums it up. So the lawyer wishing to justify himself said, who is my neighbor? Yuck, 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 yuck. And Jesus' answer is not who your neighbor is. Jesus' answer is you must be neighborly. When you find somebody in need, that's your neighbor. For the Levite and the priest came across this beat up man thinking him dead, said, I can't violate the law. If I touch him, I'm unclean. Got to leave him alone. Can't touch him. Got to leave him alone. You know what the law says. You know what the law says for the priests and the Levites. Can't touch a dead man. I'm unclean. Can't do that. So a Samaritan, a half-breed, a worthless man, an outcast, says, I'll help him. I don't have any laws against being unclean. I'll take the guy and take him to an inn and give him some money and take care of him. How familiar was the good Samaritan with this injured man on the road? He didn't know him at all. See, we think our neighbor is somebody we know. It doesn't have to be somebody we know. Our neighbor is anybody who is in need. And if we have the wherewithal to minister to that need, that's what love is. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 says, Two men come into your church, one's well-dressed and one's a homeless individual almost. 
and you tell the well-dressed man, come up here to the front. We've got lots of good seats in the front. But you who are dressed poorly, why don't you sit behind the two doors so nobody sees you? Love does not show partiality. Love does not think one individual is better than another. Love is intricately linked with grace, that we understand we are or who we are by the grace of God and not by birth, not by actions, not by things we think or do, but solely because of what God has done. If that's what we truly believe, we cannot practice partiality. It would be incongruous. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, a brother comes to you and says, I'm in need. You say, go and be warmed and be filled. But you don't give him anything. How does the love of God abide in that person? You say you have faith. Without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll give the guy something. That's not bragging. That's just stating it like it is. But there are needs in the church and needs in society that are far greater than just physical needs. Some individuals have spiritual needs. Some individuals have emotional needs. And we can't perceive all of this, each one of us. But when we do, we need to reach out to people and minister to them with the love of Christ in whatever need they have. Why don't we do this more often? Because we're all together too concerned about ourselves. I'm going to, okay, that's a personal opinion. You can strike that from the record. That's my opinion, is that we're all together too concerned about ourselves to be willing to minister to others. In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said, all men will know you are my disciples if you stand up for the right constitutional amendments. If you join the Republican Party. I didn't say anything like that. That's absurd. I know it's being absurd. That's another thing that can be struck from the record. Jesus said, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the taste of heaven on earth. People will see heaven on earth when you show love to one another. That's amazing that that can happen. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 and in Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, we have something very similar. If you want to have a couple of how-tos on how to love one another, I, I think I've given a few there that talk about um, how to love one another. But Philippians chapter 1 verse 9, Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, what did Paul do? He prayed. He prayed that the love of the Philippians would grow. He prayed that the love of the Colossians would grow. And he didn't even have to teach the Thessalonians anything because they were taught by God to love one another. I don't want to make this too simplistic, but I think we need to pray for ourselves and pray for our fellow believers that we love one another. Pray for each other that we grow in love. Because if it's a fruit of the Spirit and we have to abide in Christ, what sense does it make to stir you all up and send you out to go love with all of your strength? 
Well, go love with all your strength, but go in the power of the Lord. That's a far greater strength than your own. Pray that God would give you a heart that truly loves those around you. And for some reason, there is an illustration that I left off the outline, which isn't really surprising. The other illustration is the woman who was a harlot who came to Jesus and washed his feet in the house of Simon the Pharisee. And Simon said in his heart, if this man Jesus knew who this woman was, he wouldn't let her touch his feet. And Jesus said, I know who this woman is and I know she's a sinner and I know she's been forgiven. And Simon, the reality is, he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he who is forgiven a lot, loves a lot. Now the question is, how much do you love Jesus? How much do you show you love Jesus? That you want to be in his word and you want to be in prayer and you want to be with his people and anything associated with Jesus, that's where you want to be. And I'm not saying this in a legalistic, here are the commandments that you need to follow kind of thing. Just asking where your heart is. Simon didn't love very much because he didn't need a whole lot of forgiveness. He was already righteous in his own eyes, so oh, maybe a, a couple of sins here and there. The woman knew she needed forgiveness to the bone. And when she received it, she loved in accordance to the degree that she was forgiven. And she poured herself out for Christ. Simon can't understand this, but Jesus can. So what would God be more disappointed in? An unbeliever committing unbelieving acts or one whose sin is forgiven who loves him little I can tell you what he's most disappointed in again it's my opinion but I think he's more disappointed in the believer who won't love him I, I think all believers love God but I'm asking have you seriously thought of what God has done for you as that woman knew what Christ had done for her, that you pour yourself out in love for God. So in conclusion, John chapter, 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The word that's used very often in those two verses is to know. Love demonstrates your relationship with God. If you demonstrate love, it demonstrates your relationship with the Lord. In verse 9 it says, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. Love was demonstrated by giving his son for us. The mere fact that Jesus came to the earth was amazing. But beyond that, in verse 10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, I know we're not supposed to use big theological words, but there it is. It's in the Bible, so I'm going to have to use it. The propitiation for our sins. The satisfaction of divine wrath. That's who Jesus is. The wrath of God is coming. 
men are encouraged to flee that wrath that is coming. Paul said that day is appointed by God, that all judgment will be done through Jesus Christ, having furnished proof by raising him from the dead. The wrath of God is coming. But God has made a sacrifice, a propitiation, a satisfaction of his wrath in his son so that all who trust in him will be delivered from that wrath. That's what is meant by for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. 1 John 4, 11, a conclusion. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Love is demonstrated by acting like God. Really? We're supposed to act like God? Is that possible? You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Yes, it is possible. It's not only possible, it's demanded. I'm not saying any one of us will be perfect on this side of glory. But that is the goal. And if you have your sight set any lower, you'll just fail even more miserably. The goal has to be the perfection of God. The goal has to be loving as God loved. And how did God love? He gave that which was most precious to him, his son, for that which had offended him to the nth degree because he loved them and brought them into his kingdom. Verses 12 through 14, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he is given of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Love is a taste of heaven on earth. It says no one has seen God at any time. Any of y'all seen God? No, we haven't seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. So when you practice love to your brother, everybody gets to see what God is like. Isn't that amazing? A little taste of heaven on earth. Not that earth will ever be heaven. Not that our citizenship is ever on earth. It's always in heaven. We are to set our mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. But while we live on the earth, let's practice love so that others might see who the true and the living God is. Verse 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. God is love. To abide with God is to practice love. Do you want to abide with God? Do you want to abide in Christ? Do you want to bear fruit? Will it be seen by your practice of love? And verse 17, by this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. God has made us to be like him. Little children, it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we'll be like him. Really? Yeah. Isn't that great? We can be like him now. By trusting in the Lord, seeking the Spirit's help to love one another. A person wrote a hymn called, May the Mind of Christ My Savior. And one of the verses goes something like this, and you may need to help me because I forget when I get up here. May the love of Jesus fill me as the waters fill the sea. Him exalting, self-abasing, this is victory. It was a prayer. May the love of Jesus fill me. May that be the prayer of all of us. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for your amazing grace, your amazing love, the gift of your Son, the teaching of your Spirit. Forgive me for interjecting my own opinions, but let us hold fast to the truth of your word. And may you, by the power of your Spirit, produce in us fruit abundantly, that individuals would see in us the love of God, and so glorify your great and holy name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.